the core of the issue I think that we're grappling with here and the one that's probably caused a lot of panic for people since the beginning of the year is that the tools that Hassan's just talked about can be used to generate plausible artifacts that can be submitted for assessment tasks that require almost no work whatsoever. Now, parts of this problem were evident before, you know, contract cheating and other, you know, nefarious aspects of student learning experiences have posed some of the same sorts of challenges, but this is certainly changing, changing the playing field quite dramatically. So whereas something like contract cheating required students to go out of their way, um, pay money, potentially be blackmailed, this is a situation where these tools are available for free everywhere and increasingly within the productivity tools that we're all collectively using. So it does create quite an acute problem. And while a lot of this stuff has disappeared off the newspapers, it's not no longer the, the front page news that it was in January and February, uh, the problem is nonetheless still there. And if anything, the problem has become even worse because the tools have gotten better and students have, are able to use the tools more effectively. Um, it's not just a case of submit something to chat GPT, get an output and submit that as a piece of assessment. There are many, many ways in which these tools can be used as part of that process. So a few months ago, uh, myself, uh, Jacqueline Broadbent from Deakin and Sarah Howard from the University of Wollongong got to mapping out what we thought were some of the kind of long, medium, the short, medium and long-term implications for the decisions that we might make relative to this. I've talked about this previously, I won't dwell on it too much, but to say that um, largely we're really thinking we need to consider uh, and to continue to consider the role of invigilated types of assessment, pen and paper exams, for example, that's not going away. However, it's probably not the entire solution to this problem either. We do need to start thinking about embracing these tools, given how deeply embedded they are within uh, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and so on. But we also need to think about what does it mean to rethink assessment processes? So a lot of the work over the last couple of months has been focused in that area in particular. Um, as was evident in this UNESCO report, I think this was Mike Sharple's work from the UK, we're seeing quite a complex situation emerge in the way that students are using these tools. And there are all sorts of possibilities on the table, some of which we could say are fairly innocuous and probably fine. Others start to veer into the territory of the students getting the machines to do the work for them. Where we draw the line there is difficult. Uh, because the tools are changing and the way that we understand how we interact with these tools is constantly evolving also. So there are changes, including the ones that Hassan has just spoken about. But I think the other side of it and the bit that uh, particularly my my lab group are interested in is what are, what, are, what are students finding in the way that they're using these tools and how is it affecting the learning process on the way? Without knowing that, it's kind of hard to tell what is appropriate or inappropriate. Um, so we're still in quite a messy space as far as that goes. Um, and it's difficult to draw off a, a very clear line between appropriate and inappropriate use. I'm about to talk about some of the work that we've been doing with the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency. I got it right that time, TEXA, which many, if not all of you are familiar with. As part of that work, we wanted to go back and, and revisit what is it that we know about good assessment design? And does that help us to think about what a direction forward might be? We went back to this document. Some of you might be familiar with this, Assessment 2020. Dave Bowd and a cast of thousands put this together uh, in 2010, so some time ago now. And the group of us who have been working on this nationally looked at this and they still hold. All right? So what works is good assessment design is, is fundamentally what still works, what has worked for a long time. The question is whether or not we have met the aspirations that were set out in this document. And I think perhaps we've fallen short a little bit, which is why we now find ourselves in the situation that we're currently in. So if you haven't read this, it might feel like it's a bit dated given the current moment we find ourselves in. But uh, I think, again, given the group of us, I see Christine's just popped up on my screen now, was involved in this process as well. We endorse these principles, you know, the design principles of good assessment hold. And if we were doing a lot of these things, we would probably be slightly better placed than we are currently. So some key things in that document, if you haven't seen it before, assessment should be central to teaching and curriculum. We need to think about judgments about student work and that they're meeting appropriate standards. Hopefully we're doing those. Uh, it plays a key role in fostering learning as well as certifying students. So both of those things in parallel. 
below those kind of core principles in this assessment 2020 document, they also outline these aspirations, if you like, for what good assessment design should look like. Should engage students in learning, feedback should be part of the process, uh, deliberately incorporated into it. We're, we're talking about a situation where students and teachers are responsible partners in learning. Um, students are given an opportunity to be inducted into assessment practices. Uh, assessment is at the center of the design process. It's a focus for staff and institutional development and trustworthy representations of student achievement are represented therein. So good assessment design is still good assessment design. I don't think anything that we've seen this year would suggest that we should be moving away from any of these. However, many of you will have heard this story. I won't spend a lot of time going over it. We do talk about the process of arriving what we have in this document within the document itself. A number of the people in this webinar with us today, including Hassan and Christine, um, have contributed to this. So it was a collaborative effort. We, uh, a group of us spent two days in Sydney, really thinking about if we take Assessment 2020 as a foundation, what do we need to do now? What is the direction that we need to head in in order to think about what a reform of assessment might look like that generative AI has forced upon us? As a result of those discussions and then a, a broader collaboration uh, and consultation with another 40 people around the country, so we've got over 60 people who have now contributed to this, that was a deliberate approach because if we want this to feel like something that is by the sector for the sector, so the whole country um, has had some sort of input in this across different institutions and different uh, roles within those institutions and so on, we've arrived at two guiding principles. Assessment and learning experience should equip students ethically and actively engage with a society pervaded with AI. So partly what we're getting at here is that this is here now, the genie's out of the bottle, and we need to think carefully about what that means for what we do to prepare students for a world where this is a reality that we're in. There are a few people around who are still saying, you know, this is all a big blow up and it's a storm in a teacup and it'll go away and we'll go back to normal next year. I'm not so sure about that. There are others who are saying that this is as fundamental to our relationship a, to, a change to our relationship to information and knowledge as the internet itself was. Um, I, I tend to lean more towards the latter than the, the former, but I guess time will tell. The second one of our guiding principles is that we need to be certain at times that students are doing the work that leads to the production of various different artifacts. The way that we represent this is that we take multiple approaches, that we're inclusive in the way that we do that, that they're contextualised, but we are through whatever means, able to make trustworthy judgments that the work we're seeing is a result of that student's effort and their learning over time. Um, so guiding principles as a starting point. From there, we have a set of propositions, some of which are no surprise and build on assessment 2020 directly, some of which are a slightly different direction. We need to emphasize the following. Uh, engagement with AI authentically as part of the process. We need to think about assessment more programmatically which means not just I need to worry about this particular assessment task or this set of assessment tasks in my course, but what does that look like across the program? In some instances, that's going to be challenging, particularly quite flexible programs. Think about the BA or the Bachelor of Science. Uh, we need to emphasise the learning process more. If machines can produce the artefacts without going through the process, then we need to do more to focus on the process. We need to give students opportunities to work with each other as well as with AI, so understanding the dynamics between humans and between humans and AI in this instance is going to be important for helping us to realize that one. And then the last one there is the, what I, for the academic integrity people in particular, we must be certain that there is security and appropriate security at meaningful points across a program so that, again, we can be absolutely certain that the student we have there and that we're providing a credential for has done the required work and is meeting the outcomes rather than getting the machine to do, to do it for them. So that's part of the direction that we're that we've sort of broadly agreed that we should be heading in. Given all the changes that Hassan has just talked about, this is not a map, this is not a formula. We can't provide a recipe to anybody to deal with this. But what we hope we've done in this work collectively is to help provide a compass, a direction. So we find ourselves in this situation, things are changing. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we have a reasonable idea about the direction we need to head in.